In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a sirah nabawiya, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we were talking about the Prophet ﷺ distributing the spoils of war um, after the uh, battle of Hunayn and the siege that took place at the place of Ta'if. And we talked about some of the, um, you know, one of the very remarkable uh, interactions and moments from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ expressed his love, his appreciation, and his loyalty to the Ansar of Medina. What we're going to be talking about today, inshallah, as we proceed forward is we're going to be talking about the Prophet ﷺ now proceeding towards uh, Mecca from the place of Ji'irrana to actually perform the Umrah at this particular time, at this juncture. So inshallah, um, there's a few different um, stories or interactions, if you will, that we'll talk about on the Prophet ﷺ's way to actually perform the Umrah. And these are some very notable incidents that occurred at this particular time. So somewhat related to the conversation that we had last time, where um, very, you know, not maliciously, but there was unfortunately some discussion, some criticism, some conversation amongst the Ansar about uh, the Prophet ﷺ distributing the spoils of war. And how unfortunately, and again mistakenly, um, some of the Ansar had basically expressed the idea that, you know, these gifts are being given to the people of Mecca, whereas we're the people who are called upon when it's time to struggle and time to sacrifice. So, at this particular moment and juncture, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ handled that situation. The next thing that we're going to talk about here is actually something really, really uh, serious and actually quite insightful and extremely profound that occurs at this particular time. When the Prophet ﷺ is distributing the spoils of war, there were a couple of interactions, a couple of very negative interactions that occurred at that particular time. These are mentioned in numerous books of hadith. Imam Bukhari has a few different narrations about this particular interaction. And then many of the scholars of the seerah mention it in a lot more detail. And one, I wanted to share some of this because this has become very relevant again today in terms of what we're seeing playing out within the ummah. So the narration of Bukhari mentions that while the Prophet ﷺ was distributing the spoils of war, and in a more detailed narration that I'll mention in just a minute, we'll see even kind of the identity of this particular individual. But a man came up to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said that, Wallahi, I swear to God, inna hadihi la qismatun ma udila fiha. Now, to give you a little bit of context before I even start translating what exactly he says, this man was somebody who claimed to be Muslim. Now, even the language I'm using there is quite strong because I'm talking about that man claiming to be Muslim, right? Why not just say he was a Muslim? Because while we cannot doubt anyone's faith, but if there's any type of offense that is truly egregious and one that is very, very hard to get past, that is disrespect towards the Prophet wasallam. That is something that is truly uh, intolerable is there's disrespect in the face of the Prophet ﷺ. So this man is somebody who claimed to be Muslim, was there present, physically present with the Muslims. He was somebody who 
you know, had the outward appearance of being a Muslim. And he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says, "Wallahi, I swear to God, in the la qisma ma udila fiha that this distribution was not fair; it was not just." And the distributor was the Prophet ﷺ. So that's quite shocking in and of itself. And then he goes further, he says, وَمَا أُرِيدَ فِيهَا وَجْهُ اللَّهِ That the pleasure of God, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not intended within this distribution. That the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not the objective here in this distribution. فَقُلْتُ the Sahabi who narrates this particular incident, some of the narrations mention that it was Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Some other narrations are also from other companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such as um, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And another narration mentions that it was a man from the Ansar. So this man says, who's narrating this, he says, فَقُلْتُ وَاللَّهِ لَأُخْبِرَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says, I swear to God, I'm going to tell the Prophet ﷺ what you said. And because this is so serious, the, the, I mean, it's such a serious accusation. He's saying that this was not fair, this was not just, and this was not done in a way that is pleasing to Allah. And it's the Prophet ﷺ doing it. So he says, I'm going to inform the Prophet ﷺ about this, about these comments of yours. فَأَتَيْتُهُ فَأَخْبَرْتُهُ He says, I went to the Prophet ﷺ and I told him exactly what that man has said. That that man over there, he says such and such. The Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, he made the comment, he said, مَنْ يَعْدِلُوا إِذَا لَمْ يَعْدِلِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ He says, who will practice justice if God and His Messenger do not practice justice? That if Allah and His Messenger are not fair, are not just, then who is just? Who is fair? Who could ever be more fair, more just than Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In another narration of Imam Bukhari as well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or excuse me, in another narration, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَيْلَكَ Because in this particular narration of Layth bin Sa'ad, the man actually said it to the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Muhammad, i'dil. Hey, he said, Hey Muhammad, be fair. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Waylak, what is wrong with you? Who is fair if I am not fair? Who would be just if I'm not practicing justice? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Laqad khibtu wa khasirtu idha lam akun a'adil. The Prophet ﷺ said, I would be ruined. I would be doomed if I was not fair. I have to practice justice. And the Prophet ﷺ made a comment at this particular juncture. He said, Rahim Allahu Musa. There's great wisdom in this comment. The Prophet ﷺ said, Rahim Allahu Musa. May God have mercy upon Musa salam, the Prophet Moses. Qad bi akthar min hadha fasabar. That he was offended even worse than this, but he practiced patience. Musa salam was offended even worse than this to his face, but he practiced patience. There the Prophet wasallam actually teaches us a very profound lesson that difficulty, adversity, uh, unfavorable situations and circumstances, offenses, things like this will happen, things like this will transpire, things like this will occur. But the way to handle those situations, the way to resolve these circumstances, the way to persevere and get through these types of situations, is by means of seeking inspiration and drawing from the convictions of the people that came before us. This is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ That there most definitely are great lessons in the stories of the prophets that came before you. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى These are not just stories that were made up. وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ Rather these affirm reality, these are truth and reality. وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And in this is the details of how to go about in conducting yourself. In another uh, ayah of the Qur'an, Allah says, وَكُلَّ نَقُصُ عَلَيْكَ مِنَ بَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ That all these stories of the Prophets, we tell you, we tell you these stories so that this will strengthen your resolve. 
So what we have to understand is that the stories of the prophets that are ta- taught to us within the Quran are not just stories for the sake of history, are not just stories for the sake of entertainment, God forbid, but rather these are sources of inspiration. We're supposed to draw on them, take from them, look at them, reflect upon them, channel them in our own moments of d- adversity and tragedy and difficulty. Then the life of the Prophet ﷺ itself, it becomes a sword. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا The Prophet ﷺ is the ultimate role model. That the life of the Prophet ﷺ becomes a source of inspiration for us. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, their lives, their experiences, their challenges, their adversities, their tests and trials, are also a source of inspiration and strength for us. So here... The Prophet ﷺ very practically demonstrates that when he is offended to his face by somebody who pretends to be a part of his own community, the Prophet ﷺ does not, you know, get... Um, the Prophet ﷺ is not, you know, torn up by this. The Prophet ﷺ is not infuriated by this. But the Prophet ﷺ, what he does is in that moment, he looks at somebody who came before him, who dealt with adversity, who dealt with disrespect and offense... And then the Prophet ﷺ draws inspiration from that. That Musa ﷺ was offended so much more severely than what this man said to me. But Musa ﷺ never lost his cool. He always remained patient. He always remained steadfast. And that's what I shall do. But in another narration, in some of the other narrations in the books of Sirah, the Prophet ﷺ commented on this further. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. That Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu in one narration, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu and he says, Da'ani ya Rasulallah fa'aqtul hadha al-munafiq. He says, O oh, Messenger of God, give me permission, I'll go kill this hypocrite. Because somebody who slanders the Prophet sallallahu to his face, and then somehow still says, I'm a Muslim, there's only one explanation, that person must be a hypocrite. A person is an enemy of the deen and the religion itself. So he says, allow me, and I will kill this man. The Prophet wasallam. this is a hadith of Sahih Muslim. The Prophet wasallam said, Ma'adha Allah, an yatahaddatha nasu anni aqtulu ashabi. He says, absolutely not, God forbid, I would not want to create a situation where people could claim that I kill my own companions. I kill my own people. Then the Prophet wasallam said, said the thing that I really wanted to emphasize today. He said, "Inna hada wa ashabahu yaqra'un al-Qur'an la yujawizu hanajirahum yamruquna minhu kama yamruqu sahmu min al-ramya." He said, "Min al-ramya." Excuse me. He said that the Prophet wasallam said, "This guy and his ilk, this individual and the people who are like him, his sort, his ilk." They read the Qur'an, but it does not go past their throats. It does not go to their hearts. They are not illuminated, they are not enlightened by the nur of the Qur'an. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that they leave the religion, like the arrow leaves the bow. Just like when you shoot the arrow out of the bow, it just flies out. That's how these people fly out of the religion, because of what comes out of their mouths and what they say and what they do. Their righteous indignation, their delusions of piety and grandeur, their misplaced sense of piety, and their 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 and this is a word I do not use lightly or easily, but their extremism, their hulu, that they become more pious in the religion itself, that even the religion doesn't govern them anymore. And they have somehow risen above the confines and the constructs of the religion itself. And there's an even more detailed narration that there is some you know, discussion about its authenticity, but it's from one of the books of Sirah. Ibn Ishaq relates this, where the Prophet ﷺ kind of commented on this even further. And I want to share some of these comments. The Prophet ﷺ, it actually names the person that he was from Banu Tamim. And his name was reported to be Dhul Khuwaisira. That he came and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad, claims to be a Muslim, Ya Muhammad. See, that's the thing. One of the things I'm going to comment about is, these people don't read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They just act like they know what's in the book of Allah. Otherwise, he'd know that Allah said, لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا. You don't call on the messenger the way you call on each other. When I want to talk to my friend Ma'had, I say, Ya Ma'had. 
Hey, Ma'had. Do I want to talk to you? Irfan. I say, hey, Irfan. That's how I address a friend. Ba'dukum ba'da. When they want to talk to me, they say, hey, Abdul Nasir. Ya, Abdul Nasir. Ba'dukum ba'da. But you don't call on the Messenger Sallallahu that way. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah. That's how you speak to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu with respect. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That's how we speak about him. The Messenger of Allah, Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's how we speak. Ya Muhammad, this guy walks up. He says, Qad ra'aytu ma sana'ta fi hadha al-yawm. I've been watching what you've been doing. Ajeeb. I've been watching what you've been doing. فَقَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ أَجَلْ The Prophet said, good. <laughs> right? فَكَيْفَ رَأَيْتَ What did you see? What did you think about what you saw? He said, أَجَلْ Good. What have you seen? قَالَ لَمْ أَرَكَ عَدَلْتَ SubhanAllah. It's hard to even like read it. He says, I did not see you being just. I did not see you being fair. You have not been fair today. فَغَدِبَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet ﷺ got a little perturbed. He was upset by this comment. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَيْحَكْ What is wrong with you? إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنِ الْعَادِلُ عِنْدِي فَعِنْدَ مَنْ يَكُنْ If I will not be fair, then who will be just? Who will be fair? Who can possibly be more fair, more just than the Prophet ﷺ? فَقَالَ عُمْرُ بْنُ الْخَطَابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُ Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, similar narration, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ala naqtuluhu, would you like us to dispose of him? So the Prophet said, La, da'uhu, leave him. But this is the comment, this is the part of it. The Prophet said, Fa innahu sayakunu lahu shi'atun. There will be a whole group of these types of people one day. Yata'ammaquna fi deen. They will. So over, overzealously indulge within what they think is the religion, their concept of the religion, hatta yakhruju minhu kama yakhruju sahmu min ramiya. Eventually, they will be catapulted from the religion like the arrow is shot out of the bow. And so the reason, this is a very profound moment. Imam Bukhari mentions like three different narrations. Imam Muslim brings a hadith about this particular incident. The scholars of the seerah do. And this is a very landmark moment. Because this was a moment now where the Muslim community was growing. Islam was enjoying its victory. Islam was spreading far and wide. The foundations of the deen and the community had been set. And here arise some individuals, some people, who think that they are so above and beyond everyone else so self-righteous that they are actually talking down to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this, this, this is a fitna that will arise within my ummah. And this is something that when the Prophet ﷺ said, many of the great scholars of our deen and religion have basically said this one of the manifestations of this prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ, that there will be a whole group of such people was the appearance of a group that, that was referred to in early Islam as the Khawarij. They were, they were extremists. They were overzealous. They were out of control. And they purported to such levels of piety that they would commit that they would anathematize the vast overwhelming majority of the Muslims. That they would do mass takfir. They would, they would actually commit, they would, they would claim that the vast overwhelming majority of Muslims in the world had actually, were no longer in the fold of Islam. And they would apostate, they would, they would claim that they were all apostates. And thereby, they would basically massacre, they would kill, they would massacre, they would raid towns of Muslims. They would kill women and children. They would assassinate the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. These were the people who assassinated Uthman, Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, and so many other companions of the Prophet ﷺ. That two of these people, Uthman and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum, were promised paradise by the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. And for you to declare them to be outside of the fold of Islam and worthy of being murdered and assassinated, what Islam is this? This is no Islam. 
And a lot of what we see playing out right now in the global scene of Muslims, where what we see with these, you know, these, these groups of people that are one, majority of them, my personal convictions are that they're just criminals. And this covering of a particular type of religion or whatever you want to call it, most of these, you know, whether it be Al-Qaeda or ISIS and people of this ilk, most of them are just actually criminal people that are just looking for outlets to be able to just exercise their own kind of will and desire. And they just look for some type of a religious covering, justification for their actions. All right? But there are definitely folks amongst them who actually get to a certain get to such a point of um, delusions and an extreme radical thought and behavior that the Prophet ﷺ admonished them and talked about them. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us about them. And these were such people that sometimes, you know, we, we, we think it's hyperbole. We think that it's commentary. When we say that if the Prophet ﷺ was here, or if the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were here, if the Prophet ﷺ himself were here, these people wouldn't even listen to the Prophet ﷺ. That's not just commentary. That's not, you know, that's not hyperbole. That's not just extrapolation. That is quite literally what happened. This man walks up to the Prophet ﷺ, points his finger in the face of the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, hey, be fair, ya Muhammad. Crazy. This is not Islam. And so this is an interaction that occurred with the Prophet ﷺ. It's a very profound moment and one that I thought that we should talk about and kind of learn a, a bit of a lesson from. The next thing I wanted to mention that happens here at the place of Ja'ir Rana, as they're about to depart for their Umrah, which we'll, talk, which we'll talk about in just a moment. The Prophet ﷺ, there was a particular individual the Prophet ﷺ was looking for. Because there were some uh, unsettled matters, there were some things, some debts and things like that that had to be settled. Some things had to be figured out. So there's a narration where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنْ قَدَرْتُمْ عَلَى بِجَادٍ رَجُلٍ مِنْ بَنِي سَعَدْ بِنْ بَكَرْ there, were, there was a man from Banu Sa'ad bin Bakr. Now Banu Sa'ad bin Bakr is the tribe of Halima. The, na- the nanny and the nurse, the, m- the mother, the foster mother of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why she was known as Halima as Sa'diyya. She was from Banu Sa'ad. Okay? So the Prophet said, I'm looking for a man named Bijad. In another narration mentions his name was Mijad. Nevertheless, the Prophet said, if you find him, فَلَا يُفْلِتَنَّكُمْ Don't let him, don't, 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 don't let him leave. I need to speak to him, I need to talk to him, I need to handle something. Nevertheless, when they found him, there was a group of people from Banu Sa'ad with him. When they brought these people there, a woman in that group says that, تَعَلَّمُوا She says, pay attention. وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأُخْتُ صَاحِبِكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَاعَةِ I am the sister of your Prophet. They bring this group and they tell the group to wait here. The Prophet ﷺ requested to speak to one of you. So all of y'all wait here. And one of the women in the group, she says, I am the foster sister of the Prophet ﷺ. Rada'a means that we were nursed by the same woman. We were given milk by the same woman. I am the sister of your Prophet. فَلَمْ يُصَدِّقُوهَا Most of the companions didn't believe her. They just said maybe she's just kind of saying this to get out of here or to try to get something. Or... Because as far as the companions were concerned, the Prophet ﷺ did not have any siblings. They didn't know about this. So they were very skeptical. So they went to, they go to the Prophet ﷺ, the narration mentions Ibn Ishaq says, they said, Ya Rasulullah, they go to the Prophet ﷺ and they say that, there's a woman here, we found the people that you were looking for, and there's a woman who says she's your sister. So the Prophet ﷺ comes, he arrives, he approaches and he says, uh, and she says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, she's accepted Islam, Ya Rasulullah, Inni uhtuka min ar-rada'ati. I am your foster sister. The Prophet ﷺ asks her, "Wa ma alama tu thalik? What proof and evidence do you have that you are my sister?" She says, "Adatun adit taniha fi zahri wa ana mutawarrikatuk." 
She says that in another narration, she mentions not, in this narration, she mentions her back. In another narration, she mentions like her shoulder. So maybe it was just kind of the backside of the arm or the backside of the shoulder. She says that you bit me on my shoulder when you were a boy, when you were a kid, when you came to stay with us, I was carrying you. So you know how you kind of carry a child? So I was carrying you on my hip. I was carrying you on my hip and I was taking you into the house and you didn't want to go into the house. And so what you did was you bit me. Like really badly. And she said, I still have the scar from it. And the narration says that she basically moves like the shawl and she shows the Prophet ﷺ the scar and the Prophet ﷺ remembers it. He remembers it. And when the Prophet ﷺ sees the scar... He's so overcome with emotion, he stands up. Now, I've talked about it multiple times. The way the Prophet ﷺ used to dress was, he would tie a lower garment around his waist like ihram. And he'd have a shawl over his shoulders. He immediately got up, he took off the shawl off of his shoulders, he put it down on the ground and he asked her to please come sit on top of his shirt. It's like taking your jacket off and putting it down and saying, please sit here. So he says, please get, sit here. And she comes and she sits down over there and the Prophet ﷺ sits down next to her. And the Prophet ﷺ gets excited. The Sahaba say, we hadn't, we hadn't seen him this excited in so long. The Prophet ﷺ said, bring some dates, bring some water, my sister's here. And they bring some food and water and they serve it to her and they talk and they catch up a little bit. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, you know, he, he asks her. He says, in ahbabti fa'indi muhabbatun mukrama." وَإِنْ أَحْبَبْتِي أَنْ أُمَتِّعُكِ وَتَرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ قَوْمِكِ فَعَلْتُ The Prophet ﷺ said, you have a choice. You can stay with me and you will be loved and you will be honored and you will be cherished. Your family. You're my sister. So if you stay with me, it would make me happy. And I'll take care of you. But if you do want to go back home, because he realized she probably has a life of her own, a family of her own. He said, if you want to go back home, I will give you, you know, some supplies and things like that. Because the narration, some of the narrations mentioned that the people of Banu Sa'ad had actually been suffering through a drought. They had been suffering quite a bit of economic hardship recently. So he said, I will give you some supplies, I'll give you some, you know, some, some, some relief. And then you can go back home to your people. And she said to the Prophet ﷺ, بَلْ تُمَتِّعُنِي وَتَرُدُّنِي إِلَىٰ قَوْمِي I'd like it if you could send me back home to my people and help us out. And so the Prophet ﷺ gave her uh, quite a bit of gifts and the Prophet ﷺ um, you know, gave her some supplies and the Prophet ﷺ sent her on her way. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said to her, you remember you have an open door with me at all times. You're my sister. He said, Sali tu'ata. Anytime you need anything, ask me and I, you will be given. وَشْفَعِي تُشَفَعِي Anytime you need any favors, come and ask me and it will be taken care of. You're my sister, you're my big sister. And so this is a very, very beautiful moment where the Prophet ﷺ was reunited from somebody from his childhood. And there's actually, just in case of memory kind of fades, I had talked about this all all the way back when we had started the series on the life of the Prophet ﷺ from his childhood. But there's a very beautiful interaction, there's a very beautiful narration about this sister's name. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention her name. The name of this particular sister of the Prophet ﷺ is Ashayma. Ashayma. That's how it's normally pronounced. It can also be pronounced Shima. But uh, the Arabs would usually pronounce it as Shayma. And so... There's another beautiful story about Shema, the older foster sister of the Prophet ﷺ, when he was a child, when he was staying with Halima Sa'diya radiallahu ta'ala anha, that they were out kind of in the countryside, and it's Arabia, it would get very, very hot at noontime, to where everybody would kind of take a little bit of a break at that time of noon, like what we kind of know as a siesta. Right, Qaylula. They would take a little bit of a break. They would come indoors. They would eat something. They would take a little bit of a power nap, if you will. And they would wait an hour or so until the sun has started its decline so that there would be a little bit more shade. And then they would go back out there. And it would sometimes, especially in the summer months, that time of noon would be so severe that they would even bring the animals in. Because even the animals could not handle the heat. So 
the foster mother of the Prophet ﷺ, Halima, had seen the Prophet ﷺ, little boy, maybe three, four years old, kind of wandering about, and he would kind of wander outside, and he'd be outside at that noontime. And it wasn't good, you know, you get a heat stroke or something like that, so she would always bring him in. So she told the older sister, who was, you know, a bit older than the Prophet ﷺ, able to take care of the child, maybe she was a teenager or so at that time, that the mother had told her, that I want you to keep an eye on him. He kind of wanders out. He'll sometimes be in his own thoughts. He'll be walking around. And he ends up outside when it's hot. And it's not good. It's not healthy for him. So I need you to keep an eye on him. Make sure he's not outside. And one particular day, Halima is inside the house at that time. And she looks out and she sees the Prophet ﷺ sitting out in the middle of the field at that time of noon. And she's immediately like, you know, she's frustrated. He's there out there again. But what infuriates her is sitting next to the Prophet ﷺ is the big sister Shema. She's sitting out there with him. And she says, what's this? I told her to keep an eye on him and now she's out there with him. So she goes out there, you know, she comes out there, stomps out there as moms do, right? What are you doing? I told you, bring him inside, this and that. And Shema kind of tells her mom, he says, And she tells her mom that, you know, I was, I, I've been keeping an eye on him like you asked me to. I haven't forgotten. And I found it very curious, when he walks around, why doesn't the sun bother him though? Like, why doesn't it bother him? Why does it not perturb him? And so I started paying attention and I noticed a bit of a shade on him. And I looked up and there's a cloud over him. And wherever he goes, the cloud follows him around providing shade. And I was so fascinated by this, and I saw him sitting out here again, and the cloud was over him giving him shade. So I came out here and sat down in the shade with him. And this added to that number, I talked about it at that time, this added to the multitude of experiences and observations that Halima had had about how amazing and remarkable the Prophet ﷺ was even in childhood. And all the miracles that he was surrounded by. So this is another uh, very interesting interaction where the Prophet ﷺ is reunited with this sister of his on, at the place of Jairana. Now, as I've been talking about uh, repeatedly, they proceed on to Jairana. They assume the state of Ihram, and now they're going to do Umrah at Jairana. The Umrah was, you know, generally speaking, it was uneventful. Um, and just what's mentioned about the Umrah of Jairana in the books of Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, uh, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, etc., etc., all the books of Hadith mention these narrations. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Qatada, one of the students of the Sahaba, he asked Anas, Sa'altu Anas ibn Malik, Qultu, Kam hajja Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa How many hajj did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa perform? Like how many times did he go for hajj? And he says, Hajjatun wahida that he went for Hajj once. وَعَتَمَرَ أَرْبَعَ مِرَارًا And the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ performed Umrah four times. He did Hajj once, Hajjatul Wida, which we will eventually get to, and he did Umrah four times, and he lists them out. Umrah to who? Zaman al The first Umrah he did was at the time of Hudaybiyah. Which, as we've talked about, was n- they didn't actually perform the Umrah, but it's referred to as Umratul Ihsar. They had Ihram, they had the, every intention to do the Umrah, but they were blocked from doing so. And so the ruling, as the Quran says, If you're not able to go, then you make your sacrifice there, you shave your head, you come out from the Ihram, and you return back, and you try to come back and make up for it another time. But nevertheless, they, what they were told was, they got the full reward of the Umrah. So that's counted as Umrah number one. The second Umrah was Umrah al qada The Umrah they made up for, the, the Hudaybiyah Umrah, they made up for the following year, which was a part of the treaty of Hudaybiyah, where they came to Mecca for three days and performed Umrah. So that's number two. Umrah al Jairana, this Umrah after the conquest of Mecca, the battle of Hunayn, the siege of At-Ta'if, then on their way back to Mecca, now the the battles and everything had been completely taken care of. They now went into Ihram peacefully and they performed their Umrah before returning back to Medina. That's the third one. And the fourth Umrah would be Al-Umrah Tullati Qaranaha bi Hajjatihi. The Umrah the Prophet ﷺ performed when he came for the Hajj. 
All right, because it's called Hajjul Qiran, where the Prophet ﷺ did ihram. He came to Mecca, he performed in Umrah, remained in that ihram, and then performed Hajj in that same ihram. When we, when people usually go, if anyone's ever been for Hajj and they're trying to remember their own experience, what we usually do is called Hajjul Tamatur, where you put on your ihram, you go, you do Umrah, you come out from your ihram, and then when the days of Hajj arrive, you go back into ihram, and now you perform the Hajj. So the fourth Umrah he performed was the one that was with his Hajj. And so this was the third one. And as I said, generally speaking, it was pretty uneventful at this time. Uh, there were no you know, um, experiences out of the sort or anything like that. And after performing this Umrah, the Prophet ﷺ said that we have been gone from Medina for long enough. That it's time to go home. Remember what he had told the Ansar. I will go home with you. Medina is home. Y'all are family. So he said, it's time to go home. Let's go home. And Makkah was so precious, so precious, so important, that the Prophet ﷺ said, I will leave people in charge here to take care of Makkah. And he appointed a sahabi by the name of Atab ibn Asid to be the governor of Makkah, to kind of run the affairs of Makkah. And he left a second person in charge with him, whose name was Mu'adh bin Jabal, the famous companion of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the personal advanced students of the Prophet ﷺ, Mu'adh bin Jabal. He left him there in Mecca as well. Why? يُفَقِّهُ النَّاسَ فِي الدِّينِ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْقُرْآنَ That he left Mu'adh bin Jabal there to teach the people how to practice Islam and to teach them the Qur'an. So he left the teacher... Mu'ad bin Jabal, and he left somebody to run the state of affairs, a manager of Mecca, if you will. And that was Atab bin Asid. So he left it in very capable hands. But it's still such a powerful moment when you think about how precious, how sanctified, how beloved Mecca was to the Prophet ﷺ. The place he was born, the place where he was raised, the place where he lived his life, where he built a home and a family and raised his own kids, received revelation built the foundations of the community, but Medina had now become home. And so in spite of the fact that Mecca was there and it was available, the Prophet ﷺ went home to Medina. And that would always be home. And so at this particular time, the Prophet ﷺ returned home to Medina. It was at the end of the month of Dhul Qa'da, and that's the last thing I forgot to mention, excuse me, that out of the four Umrahs the Prophet ﷺ performed, the first one was Hudaybiyah, that was in the month of Dhul Qa'da. The second one was in uh, Umratul Qada, that was also in the month of Dhul Qa'da. The third one, this Umratul Ji'irrana, was also in the month of Dhul Qa'da. It was only the Hajjatul Wida' that would be performed in the beginning days of Dhul Hijjah. So this is the time when the Prophet ﷺ had performed the Umrah. And with that, inshallah, we'll conclude. And when we continue on, we'll talk about the Prophet ﷺ uh, returning back. Uh, from, uh, you know, returning back to the city of Medina and then continuing on from there. And I almost forgot, I had intended, this is something I had mentioned, I always do, that after we complete the study of a particular incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, I like to kind of mention the verses of the Qur'an that were revealed pertaining to it, because now you can see the entire fold of events. You can see uh, the entire sequence of events, and you know, packed into the ayat. So the ayahs are from Surah At-Tawbah, Surah number 9. Surah to Tawbah, Surah number 9, Ayahs 25, 26, and 27. It doesn't seem like a lot, but they're powerful. These three ayat are about this, this entire experience of Hunayn and everything. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَوَاطِنَا كَثِيرًا God aided and assisted you at many different places and situations. وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ and Allah helped you on the day of Hunayn. إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ When you, and this is Allah addressing all of you, إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ Allah is speaking to the believers, not the Prophet ﷺ of course, but when all of you, O Muslims, had become very enamored, you had become very impressed and enamored with your numbers. فَلَمْ تُغْنِي عَنْكُمْ شَيْئًا And that did not help you in the least bit. Your numbers were no good to you. They didn't help you. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْأَرْضِ And the situation started to shrink around you. The situation started to collapse in on you. 
بِمَا رَحُبَتْ In spite of the earth being very vast, it seemed like the earth was closing in and around you. What it basically means, you had all the resources in the world, but yet it seemed like your situation was collapsing in on itself. ثُمَّ وَلَّيْتُمْ مُدْبِرِينَ And then many of you turned and started to run. ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ But then Allah sent down His tranquility. عَلَى رَسُولِهِ Upon His Messenger. وَعَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And upon the believers. وَأَنزَلَ جُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And He sent down an army that you could not see. وَعَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted by, with His punishment those who disbelieved. وَذَٰلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ And that is the recompense, the reward of those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ مِن بَعْدِ ذَٰلِكَ عَلَىٰ مَنْ يَشَاءُ But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave after that whomsoever He willed. The, the, unfortunately, some of the believers who might have been a bit shaky in that moment, who had turned and ran, they repented to God and Allah accepted their repentance. Allah forgave them. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is constantly forgiving and constantly merciful. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah for His forgiveness and His mercy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the life of the Prophet a source of inspiration and a source of direction for each and every single one of us. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfiruk wa natubu ilayk.